I'm Bill Sewell. Uh, I'm a, a member of the uh, 3CT, uh, the sponsors of this, um, this marvelous gathering. Uh, and I wanted to welcome you uh, this morning. Uh, a very sizable crowd for a snowy uh, uh, Saturday morning. I want to thank you all for coming out. Um, I also want to uh, welcome our uh, participants uh, from the Human Sciences Research Council in Cape Town uh, to this meeting. They're uh, with us via video. Uh, and uh, I gather they were also uh, present uh, via video yesterday and have, in fact, uh, sent in some comments on the second uh, panel, which we, we won't deal with now, but, but presumably sometime later in the day, um, we, we will uh, have something to say uh, with respect to those, uh, those comments. Um, I want to thank uh, various organizations and, and uh, units of the university uh, for co-sponsoring uh, this event. Um, the Frankie Institute for Humanities, the History Department, the Norman Waite Harris Fund, the Anthropology Department, the Nicholson Center, the Social Science Division, and the Political Science Department. Um, and I also want to thank the uh, Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Uh, that's not, I think, an American foundation, but I'm not sure, given the... <laughs> given the uh, a surprising name for a foundation, but welcome. Um, and the Open Society Initiative uh, for South Africa for giving us the opportunity, uh, uh, for, for uh, you know, giving us the opportunity to be in contact um, with uh, South Africa via video. Um, so uh, let me turn it over to Judith. Okay, I'm Judith Farquhar of the Anthropology Department here, also a participant in. Uh, Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory events often, uh, and it's great to see so many people here indeed. Uh, this panel is Neoliberalism as Ideology and as Policy. You will have noticed that uh, Saskia Sassen is not here. She called with uh, great regrets this morning because of, because of a family illness she wasn't able to get away. Uh, everyone else, however, is here. Uh, including all co-authors and James Sparrow who's sitting where he can see the slides for the time being. Um, and uh, I think what I'll do is uh, introduce uh, everyone at once and then they can uh, segue smoothly uh, from one to the other. So we'll, uh, we'll begin with uh, a paper by Neil Brenner, Jamie Peck, and Nick Theodore, um, which the title of which has changed and that will go up in a moment. So I won't announce the old title, which was an interrogative. It looks like they've begun to answer some of the questions they initially had. Ah, no, that's true. <laughs> And uh, then we will shift to a paper by Peter Evans and William Sewell, um, the title of which may still be The Neoliberal Era, Ideology, Policy, and Social Effects. Uh, and then uh, uh, James Sparrow will provide comments on those two papers and possibly on something Saskia may have sent ahead. Okay, great. And uh, we should, uh, as a result, have plenty of time for questions, comments, and discussion. So let's just begin. So good morning, everybody. Um, so as Judith mentioned, Nick and Jamie are in the audience. And if I say anything that you disagree with or that's really problematic, I refer you to my distinguished co-authors right over there. Um, now, there are many challenges to interpreting the contemporary global crisis of capitalism. Some of them are obviously empirical. We need to try to understand empirical trends, dynamics. Some of them are methodological. We need to try to figure out how to study these trends and dynamics. But arguably, a significant aspect of the challenge is conceptual. So many of our categories that we use to study contemporary capitalism are derived from earlier moments in the history of capitalism, whether from the 19th century, the early 20th century, when the social sciences were consolidated, or in significant cases also from the post-war Fortis Keynesian period. So we're operating with many categories and many assumptions that are really derived from an earlier moment in a dynamically evolving system. So one of the challenges in many different realms of social inquiry is, is really conceptual. 
to try to think carefully about the conceptual foundations of what we're arguing about and what we're trying to study. And it seems to me in this context, um, the work that 3CT is doing is really fundamental. Because so much work that's done in the social science is really justified externally and internally in terms of churning out empirical research. But to have an organization that's specifically, I mean, among other things, oriented towards these kinds of conceptual, found, conceptual questions seems to me really, really fundamental. And, and we're all fortunate to have such an, such an institution that, that demarcates a space for that kind of work, which is, I would argue, and I think others you know, would, would argue as well here, that, that this is as foundational, if not more foundational, to the kinds of empirical inquiries around which, around which so much uh, research and also education um, is organized. So I think that's kind of a framing point about the conference, but also about you know, this, this panel, this, this kind of problematique. So in that spirit, um, one of the issues that emerged yesterday as kind of a, an issue, but kind of in the background, was the issue of regulatory restructuring under capitalism. And a number of arguments, I think very important and provocative arguments were made about dynamics of regulatory change. And, and what we want to do in our paper, and I think what this panel is going to try to do, is really hone in a little more carefully, a little more uh, in a more focused way, on some of the concepts that are used to think about processes of regulatory restructuring. I think we would all agree that the contemporary global crisis of capitalism, whatever, whatever that might entail, is also a regulatory crisis. It's a crisis of inherited formations of regulation, um, and it's also expressed um, in the search for new forms of regulation to deal with some of the types of dynamics that were discussed yesterday. So um, it's a problem of state theory, and it's a problem that can be articulated on many different scales. Now, the concept of neoliberalism has been a key word of these debates. It's been a key word for thinking about the dynamics of post-1970s regulatory restructuring, for periodizing those dynamics. And it's certainly been a key word, I think, in interesting and also very problematic ways in um, trying to think about the regulatory dimensions and consequences of the crises of the last um, couple of years. In some ways, this concept is used, in some strands of critical social science, the concept is used in, I think, very rigorous and productive ways, but we would argue that it's also become a bit of a rascal concept, a chaotic concept, if you will. In other words, so many different uh, terms or so many different issues are subsumed under the term that it becomes, or it at least is in danger of becoming um, somewhat meaningless. So the question that we would like to think about um, is a question that um, I think is, is pretty relevant to the contemporary crisis, which is, is neoliberalism dead or is it alive? And um, the key claim that we're trying to make is a simple one, but one that we don't think is recognized um, adequately in the discussions of this question. And that is that um, interpretations and periodizations of the regulatory dimensions of contemporary capitalism and the contemporary crisis, they hinge upon very specific conceptualizations of regulation and of the spaces and times of regulation. And these assumptions deserve very careful interrogation. They have massive implications for how we understand not only what's happening, but, but what is to be done about what's happening. So the question, is neoliberalism dead? Well, I think as David uh, Harvey said at some point, it depends what you mean by neoliberalism, but also we would add it depends what you mean by dead, or and if it's alive, it depends what you mean it depends what you mean by alive. And so we really want to kind of dig into those kinds of questions, which we think have a lot of implications. So Jamie and Nick and I have written a couple articles on these questions. One of the articles was published last year in, in a journal called Global Networks, which interrogates three of dominant and important traditions in studying neoliberalism and neoliberalization, the comparative capitalisms debate, the historical materialist IPE discussion, particularly the work of Stephen Gill, and also a neo-Foucauldian strand of that research, or one aspect of a broader neo-Foucauldian strand, the work of Iowa Ong. Another article um, deals with questions of periodization of post-1970s regulatory restructuring and poses the question of what alternatives to a neoliberalized regulatory formation might look like. And that was just published in a journal called Globalizations. And then another article published in Antipode is specifically on the question of the crisis and whether it entails post-neoliberalism or something else. So this presentation is kind of building upon, upon that, um, 
that work. And basically, I've got two goals, which I think are already kind of implicit in what I've, what I've said already by way of introduction. One is that we, in the first part of this talk, we simply want to offer some conceptual clarification. We're very interested in the uneven spaces and times of neoliberalism, or neoliberalization, as we shall call it. So we want to offer um, kind of methodological framework for um, thinking about processes of neoliberalization and start to outline some of the methodological implications of that framework. And then in the latter part of the presentation, we will um, try to deal with the question of the implications of this conceptualization for interpreting the contemporary global crisis in particular, and also more generally for, post, for interpreting post-1970s um, regulatory restructuring, and the question of what alternatives to neoliberalization might look like. I mean, we started to open up the question yesterday of what is to be done. And part of what we want to suggest is that this question has to be embedded in uneven and contextually specific space-time frameworks. It's not just an abstract question. It has to be contextually embedded. And even more specifically than that, the terrain on which the question what is to be done has to be posed, it's already been shaped and reshaped by several decades of neoliberalizing reg regulatory reform. So the question what is to be done today is occurring in a different regulatory environment than the question what is to be done, let's say, in the 1950s or the 1930s or the 1890s. So that's, that's kind of where we're, um, we're going to go with this. So let me um, begin with some of the methodological preliminaries, and then I'll move towards the concrete um, uh, implications. So um, we definitely build our analysis on a very strong tradition of radical um, IPE and radical geographical political economy. And I just want to flag some of the work that I think will be familiar to you, but which I think is very relevant to this question of interpreting post-1970s and post-2008 regulatory reform. So this is kind of a first cut into the question. So the work of McMichael and Arrighi and Silver using a kind of Polanyian or Marxist Polanyian analysis to think about post-1970s capitalism as it were as a second great transformation, an attempt to create a self-regulating market on a world scale, the latest moment in a kind of epochal shift over the form and extent of commodification under modern capitalism. This is, we would argue, quite fundamental. Related to that, the work of Stephen Gill and others on disciplinary neoliberalism, specifically looking at the class dimensions of this regulatory assault on the post-war, post-World War II capitalist formation. Um, and they interpret this new formation, this newly emergent formation, as a new configuration of ruling class power, hegemony, and uh, dominated by what some have called the Wall Street IMF US Treasury complex and effectively grounded on a new attempt to institutionalize the, pow the power of capital on a world scale through long-term institutional reforms. And last but not least, the work of David Harvey interpreting neoliberalization as a new form of accumulation by dispossession, the, mo the violent mobilization of state strategies to expropriate populations from non-commodified modes of existence and to impose the rule of capital and commodification upon increasing aspects of social existence. So these provide us, we think, with kind of very broad and extremely useful starting points for, for beginning to decipher the very uneven geographies of post-1970s capitalism. And we want to add some methodological additions to these kinds of insights. Um, so the kind of key methodological innovation or idea is instead of speaking of neoliberalism, which implies that it's a thing, it's an epoch, it's a period. We're interested in processes of neoliberalization. And I'll try to be consistent in my own uh, vocabulary here. It's not easy. Sometimes we all, even after we've made this move, we sort of drift back into talking about neoliberalism. But we want to insist on a process-based analysis. And we would apply this, by the way, to any formation of regulatory change. So if you're interested in studying Fortis Keynesian capitalism, we would make the same argument, K Keynesianization instead of just Keynesianism. And you can push that back in time. We think it has important, um, surprisingly wide-ranging um, methodological uh, ramifications. So a couple of dimensions of this. It's a, not just a process, but as James Middleman put it with regard to the process of globalization, it's a syndrome of processes. It's not a fixed state or a condition, but a syndrome, a set of intertwined in a contradictory way 
processes of market-driven and market-oriented regulatory restructuring. We insist on the hybrid and constitutively impure aspects of this isation, this, this regulatory restructuring process. It hinges on contextually specific and unevenly articulated strategies of regulatory reorganization. There might be more or less pure forms or projects of neoliberalization that explicitly invoke the um, ideas of Friedman or Hayek or whoever, but in the kind of de facto on the ground world of regulatory contestation, they more often than not take a hybrid form in which they're embedded within and articulated to um, many other um, politico, ideological, and cultural formations. Um, this next point on state strategies I think will be um, familiar. It's been made in the literature, but we consider it foundational. It's not as many have argued, simply a rolling back of state power the way that neoliberal ideology would have it. Instead, neoliberalization is contingent upon the aggressive and often violent mobilization of state strategies in order to extend or promote market rule. Again, this is a familiar point, but it's certainly neglected in the mainstream literature and the ideological discourse of neoliberalism represents itself as doing something very different. Um, and finally, for us, neoliberalization is a deeply path-dependent process. And for the moment, we would derive two uh, dimensions from this proposition. First, um, neoliberalization projects or strategies, they assume contextually specific forms in different places. When they collide, there's kind of a, we use this collision metaphor, when they collide with inherited regulatory formations. So if you impose, let's say, privatization um, in Czechoslovakia and you impose it in, I don't know, New York City or you impose it in South Korea, you're going to get um, quite heterogeneous institutional landscapes. You're not going to get some sort of convergence of regulatory forms the way that neoliberal ideology would postulate. And a second dimension of this which has really important uh, implications we would argue for questions of periodization is that successive rounds of neoliberal experimentation at any scale, whether local, regional, national, supranational, like the EU, or global, they cumulatively transform the political and institutional terrain on which subsequent rounds of regulatory restructuring unfold. So um, when neoliberal um, retrenchment strategies were pioneered, as again David Harvey has argued, in New York City in response to the fiscal crisis in the 1970s, that was occurring in a very different, a fundamentally different regulatory landscape than the use of such strategies, let's say today, or for that matter in the 1980s or the 1990s. So we have to embed the emergence and the mobilization, the deployment of neoliberalized regulatory restructuring strategies within contextually specific and unevenly interconnected landscapes of regulatory contestation. And that, that proposition we're, I'm going to come back to because we think that has a lot of implications both for periodization but also for the question of whether something like post-neoliberalism or post-neoliberalization is actually happening. Okay, so we also, in terms of trying to decipher trajectories and pathways of regulatory restructuring, we really like this metaphor of creative destruction which applies, I think, very usefully to a lot of dimensions of socio-spatial transformation in contemporary capitalism, including to questions of regulatory change, not only to neoliberalization, but certainly it's plausible, we would argue, to view neoliberalization as a form of regulatory creative destruction. And it has both creative and destructive moments. And we use the term moment in a kind of Hegelian Marxist sense, not in a simple uh, temporal sense. In other words, it's not like there's a moment of destruction, you sort of clear the decks, and then you can build. That's not what we're saying. They're dialectically intertwined moments. They, they're contradictorily intertwined. They presuppose one another, but yet analytically one can distinguish them. So um, the destructive moment, rolling back inherited forms of nationalized state power and regulatory arrangements that might inhibit or constrain commodification and creative moment, again, this is a somewhat simplistic starting point, but you can kind of roll this forward and do a lot of work with it, we think. Um, rolling forward of new forms of rescaled or geographically reorganized state power, new regulatory arrangements that extend or intensify market relations and commodification. And again, if you embed this metaphor of creative destruction within the point I was making a moment ago about path dependency, 
it actually opens up a lot of, a lot of interesting questions. Because post-2008 post crisis, the destructive moment might actually apply to already neoliberalized formations of regulation. So, it's, so the destructive moment doesn't simply refer to Keynesian forms. It might refer to forms that were already forged in the wake of the crisis of Fordism and the different crisis tendencies of the post-1970s period. So the, the, nature, the object, the orientation of destruction and the orientation of creation, if you use those metaphors to analyze dynamics of regulatory restructuring, it has to be unpacked, again, in contextually specific, geographically embedded ways. And this leads to um, a concept that we've been kind of playing around with, um, variegated neoliberalization. So it's not just random variation. It's different here than it is there. But there's a, um, there's a differentiation and we might say heterogenization of institutional and spatial forms at different scales and at different sites. But the hetero these heterogeneous forms are also interconnected to one another. So variegation for us, and I'll, I'll have more to say about this in a few minutes, it's a deeply patterned and deeply structured and structuring kind of regulatory uh, configuration. It's not just random difference. So for, for those of you interested in the kind of more neo-Foucauldian or post-structuralist strands of the neoliberalism, neoliberalization debate, this is where we actually differ from them. Because we agree with the insistence on heterogeneity of regulatory arrangements but we insist that they are part of a broader patterned whole. So for us, that, the sort of post-structuralist position tends to emphasize variation, even though it might not describe it in those terms. For us, variegation is deeply structured. So a number of consequences of this um, kind of methodological reorientation I would like to just specify before turning to the, to the implications of it. So first of all, for us, there's no such thing as the neoliberal city, the neoliberal economy, the neoliberal state, or for that matter, the neoliberal epoch. Using this framework, that doesn't make sense. Those are, those are um, problematic concepts. Instead, for us, there are diverse place, scale, and territory-specific patterns of neoliberalization. So again, this idea of variegation. And these patterns, they're context contextually specific, and they emerge in and through the formation of alliances, again at different scales, um, promoting different types of market-driven or market-oriented solutions, apparent solutions, putative solutions, to different kinds of regulatory problems or perceived regulatory problems, whether it's housing or transportation or economic development, whatever that might mean, labor reproduction, the environment, and so forth. So it's deeply heterogeneous. Second uh, consequence, and connected to the first, seems like a trivial proposition, but it arguably has important implications. The impacts of these neoliberalization processes are quite diverse. So we know from the critical literature on neoliberalization that neoliberalized or market-based forms of governance engender regulatory failure. They don't achieve their goals. They off, more often than not, they, they exacerbate the very problem that they're trying to solve. So it might unleash a kind of dynamic burst of growth um, but can it sustain that growth in any sort of medium-term horizon? More often than not, no. And these uh, strategies tend, among other problems, to increase inequality, polarization, dysfunctional, zero-sum interlocality or interregional competition. They also tend to undermine solidarity, institutional cohesion, and environmental sustainability. So we now have a vast literature in kind of critical political economy that outlines in detail um, some of the many regulatory failures of these neoliberalized formations. Um, but such outcomes, including the failures and the effects of the failures, are um, contextually specific. They hinge on local, institutional, and political legacies and emergent lines of struggle, conflict, and resistance. Again, this is an insight. This is something that we've learned from post-structuralist discussions, although, as I've already indicated, we, um, we frame them in a broader structural context. And this brings me to the Third consequence, which is, um, to put it maybe too cryptically, there is a context of context. So we're emphasizing context, local context, geographical specificity, like the hammer home that point. But there is a context within which those contexts are embedded. And that context matters a lot 
for thinking about periodization and for thinking about political strategy. So in other words, the long-winded version of what I just said, contextual, spec contextual specificity crystallizes within a patterned network, in other words, interconnected across spaces, super local context, which at least particularly as of the 80s and 90s, tendentially reinforces market-based forms of regulation. And this context of context deserves theorization as well. So it's not just theorizing different policy pathways, different local and regional formations, but also the context of context has to be analyzed and theorized and conceptualized. Um, we call it, in our work, a rule regime, a geo-institutional rule regime which we would argue imposes determinate parameters upon local or, for that matter, national forms of regulatory experimentation. I'll return to that proposition in a few moments and flesh it out a little bit, a little bit more concretely. So this means that even if local and regional spaces might be important sites for struggles against neoliberal, neoliberalism, I did it, I meant neoliberalization, sorry. <laughs> I knew it would happen at least once. Um, so even though local and regional sites can be, uh, spaces can be sites for mobilizing alternatives, so like, I don't know, participatory budgeting in Porto Alegre, these sites cannot be lastingly effective or even be reproduced very sustainably in the absence of superlocal mobilization to roll back some of these rule regimes, which I'll say more about in a moment, that are promoting hyper-commodified market-based forms of social life. Okay, so I'm gonna skip this slide, but basically, what, what I would just say in summary of this kind of long-winded slide is just that there, there are a lot of issues about um, neoliberalization and regulatory restructuring post-1970s that we really need to gain a deeper grasp of. So, you know, we're trying to open up a framework for thinking about the geographies to create, again, to quote David Harvey, a moving map of neoliberalization. We're trying to develop some concepts for that, but from our point of view, the geographies of neoliberalization really remain poorly understood. So one research agenda that flows from this is to try to dig deeper. I mean, this is just kind of a framework. A related aspect is um, the question of the modalities. In other words, how do processes of neoliberalization get reproduced and transferred across time and space? So Nick and Jamie are writing a book right now which is on policy transfer and which is trying to look at, um, they call it fast policy, looking at the sort of um, very quick mo uh, movement of certain policy templates across scales and sites and institutions. So the question of policy transfer is, from our point of view, a key horizon for thinking about um, neoliberalization. Is it just diffusion, the way some political scientists have analyzed? In other words, neoliberal ideas are launched across the quad here, and then they... <laughs> you know, they gain influence. <laughs> or are there some other mechanisms? So, that, so the modalities need inquiry. They need to be understood. I mean, it's, a, it's really a bit of a black box. Um, and then finally, the pathways. I mean, I've said a lot already about how do we understand different trajectories and periodizations. I'll, I'll suggest in a moment some ideas about developing a periodization. But from our point of view, this, because the discussion has been so locked into a kind of dualistic contrast between like Fortis Keynesian capitalism on the one hand and then you have neoliberalism. I mean, that might be a starting point for inquiry, but ultimately it doesn't really tell you very much about the deeply uneven, again, nationally, regionally, and locally, geographies of neoliberal regulatory restructuring. So we think these pathways really need to be, under, uh, to be investigated. So I'm gonna skip all that verbiage. And uh, let me turn to um, the question. So is it dead, is it alive? I, hopefully I've said something about the it. In other words, we don't think it's an it. So it's not an it, but therefore, what are the implications of that mode of argumentation for thinking about the question of, of what's going on? So here's how we would proceed. Um, a lot of the discussion, um, both on the left and in more mainstream positions, has tended to view the global crisis of 2008 as a kind of, we call it a Berlin Wall metaphor. So kind of collapse imaginaries where there was this stable, monolithic formation, neoliberalism, and then there was this humongous crisis and the thing has collapsed. From our point of view, this is um, incredibly problematic. 
Um, they invoke a singular Big Bang failure of a unified system. And again, you know, David Harvey and others have shown, I think very convincingly, that crisis tendencies have literally ricocheted across the capitalist system and regulatory formations post-1970s. It's not like there was some resolution to the crises of Fordism and then you had like a stabilized regulatory framework. Crisis has been ongoing and this is the continuation of earlier crisis tendencies. So it's, it's not helpful, it's not productive to think of this as a big bang kind of collapse. They imply also in terms of this moment that a wall, and also in terms of earlier moments, that a wall, a kind of clear dividing line, separates neoliberalism from whatever its others might be, Keynesianism or some other kind of alternative. And as we've already suggested, we think the formation itself is deeply impure and hybrid. And once you adopt that assumption, the notion of a clear separation between delineated neoliberal strategies and other strategies starts to break down. Um, they invite the question of what's on the other side of the wall, and we don't think that's, given the pre preceding, that doesn't seem very productive. So for us, well, at the very least, we're confident in saying that it's undead. And I'll use a zombie, I'll use a zombie metaphor in a moment, so stay tuned for that. It's dead but dominant. Maybe. It's polymorphic, polycentric. Um, it's constitutively impure. Um, and again, as I've been suggesting, there's already been a kind of diffusion and naturalization of certain neoliberal policy nostrums within ostensibly opposed ideological frameworks like Keynesianism and social democracy. So that complicates the question. So for us, and uh, oops, I've done it again, neoliberalisms, and I wanted to say the Neoliberaliz I wanted to say neoliberalization. It's unequally contested across places, territories, and scales. The responses to the crisis, from our point of view, are still deeply imbued with neoliberal strategy. Um, so it's a malleable and adaptive creature of the crisis. So what I want to do in the time remaining, I've been going for about 25 minutes, and I'm going to try to finish this in like 10 minutes. And basically what I want to do now is... Um, at the beginning of the presentation, I made this remark about the question, what is to be done? We have to think about the terrain on which the question is posed and view it as the product of earlier rounds of regulatory restructuring. So what I want to do now is just introduce a kind of modest, hopefully modest, conceptual grid for thinking about post-1970s regulatory restructuring and then also for thinking about possible scenarios of, if you want, post or after neoliberalization. So the, the framework hinges upon um, insisting on the importance of uneven geographic development to the process of regulatory restructuring. And we do that by distinguishing analytically three different but intertwined dimensions of regulatory change, each of which has very particular spatial selectivities. So the first is very intuitive, I think, context-specific forms of regulatory experimentation. So in a city, in a region, in a nation state, or even at a larger scale, scale just trying to come up with a new um, regulatory strategy for dealing with a regulatory, a perceived regulatory crisis in a particular time, in a particular place. So um, second dimension, again, intertwined with the first. Simple concept, long-winded uh, term, because we couldn't think of a better term for the moment, but um, systems of interjurisdictional policy transfer. This refers to a point I made before with reference to Nick and Jamie's work. So the idea that it's not just local or regional or national regulatory experimentation. There's a lot of movement of policy templates across spaces, places, scales, and territories. And that movement evolves over time. That was the case with the development of Keynesianism, too, for that matter. So the introduction of Keynesianization didn't just occur as like giant macro framework, there was a lot of movement of these ideas in a number of different dimensions of Keynesian uh, policy that were moved around and eventually consolidated to create a broader structure. So we think that's essential. And then last but not least, this idea of rule regimes or parameterization processes. So basically a broader structural context within which the parameters for interjurisdictional policy transfer and local or regional or national regulatory experimentation um, are framed. So we would argue, and again, we would want to apply this distinction. It's a very simple distinction. We think it has 
a lot of um, potentially productive applications to different dimensions of regulatory change during the history of capitalism. But for the moment, um, we want to think about just very schematically how it might help us think about both trajectories of post-1970s neoliberalized restructuring, but also this question of scenarios for alternatives. So just very um, sketchy, but hopefully as a, as a basis for a discussion and for sort of starting to think about this question in a slightly different way, using the methodological framework that I've been trying to introduce. So um, I've got a little grid, and for those of you on this side who might not be able to see it, it's just 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, just decades. You could probably specify it much more rigorously, but just to open up the discussion. And then I've got each of our dimensions, so 70s, 80s, 90s, and then context-specific regulatory experimentation, inter-jurisdictional policy transfer, and then finally the rule regime. So just as a starting point, we would suggest that in the 1970s you have something that looks like disarticulated neoliberalization. So it just means that there are a lot of different, like the fiscal crisis of New York City response would be an example. A local experiment emerges. Um, other localized re experiments, you might, um, you might move this forward and build in Thatcher and Reagan as kind of nationalized regulatory experiments. But they're relatively disarticulated. Um, they're not part of a broader systemic regulatory arrangement yet. Second uh, moment, and again, the periodization would have to be specified more rigorously than we have, we call it orchestrated neoliberalization, and it basically means that the networks of policy transfer have been um, thickened. I mean, clearly the history of neoliberal ideology involves all kinds of policy transfer and ideological sharing uh, networks, even prior to the 1970s. But the claim that we would make is as of the 80s, those networks start to really thicken. And there's sort of a system of, um, of ideologies that says, well, this is the solution. This is the way to solve a regulatory crisis in healthcare or education or industri in, in, industrial uh, restructuring or employment. So there's a, a, a deeper coordination across different sites around the world. And then the third moment, and again, the periodization, um, apologize for the lack of rigor here, but it, we're simply trying to suggest this would be a way to develop a much more rigorous periodization, calling it for now deepening neoliberalization, which simply means that there's now something like a rule regime on a global scale through the IMF, the World Bank, maybe through the US Treasury um, complex that installs a kind of neoliberalized model on a world scale, albeit unevenly, and that imposes serious constraints upon both policy transfer networks and localized and regionalized regulatory experiments. It doesn't mean that there is no outside to this neoliberalized moment. There are plenty of regulatory experiments at various scales throughout the history, post-1970s, that aren't orthodox neoliberal strategies. And there are also other policy networks and transfer networks during this period. But the claim is that this neoliberalized moment is consolidated. So in one of our papers, in this um, Global Networks paper, we describe this as a shift from the uneven development of neoliberalization to the neoliberalization of uneven development, which basically means that in the more disarticulated and orchestrated moment, Neoliberalization itself is unevenly developed. Again, in this variegated way that I've been trying to specify, different formations um, articulated to one another unevenly within a heterogeneous institutional landscape. But by the 1990s, post-1989, um, the moment would have to be specified, you have something like a neoliberalization of uneven development in which the very logics of policy development across the world system are increasingly constrained by the um, sort of neoliberalization of rule regimes. So it's a sketch, and we certainly welcome critique and debate on it because we're trying to figure out how useful it might be. But we think making this distinction provides a pretty good starting point for thinking about regulatory change with, with sensitivity to the spatiotemporal unevenness of the process. Last slide, and, and I'll stop. So what about what is to be done and scenarios for alternatives? So this is basically on the top the same diagram before just to remind you of the periodization the proposed hypothetical periodization, disarticulated, orchestrated, and deepening. So we came up with a couple scenarios, and probably there are others, but it's just, again, an attempt to, to think about the context of context, the context and the terrain within which the question, what is to be done, alternatives, we think would need to be posed. So scenario one would be something like disarticulated counter Neoliberalization. Again, we're trying to find simpler terms, but that seems to be what we're talking about. So what do we mean by this? So 
basically a broader, um, you might call it like a zombie neoliberalism at bigger scales. So systems of interjurisdictional policy transfer in the rule regime continued adherence to some of the basic precepts of market-driven growth, extension of commodification to other to more and more realms of social and economic life. But meanwhile, within that broader kind of zombie neoliberalized context, um, proliferation of experiments that are progressive or radical and that point towards some kind of alternative. So as some of you may know in geography, there's been a discussion of alternative economies, which we think is quite interesting, but part of our problem with that literature is that it kind of, it just brackets the broader context of context, just treats these um, different sites um, outside of the broader context. And so that's, so, so, but we think this is very important. It's very important to, um, to imagine and to produce um, other regulatory formations, other forms of production and reproduction outside of a neoliberalized system. So this would be um, the moment that's articulated in what Emmanuel Wallerstein was referring to yesterday as the Porto Alegre moment. Although that might also, I'll come back to that in a second because the Porto Alegre moment also extends to the other scales. But in some ways it begins at a local scale. Um, orchestrated counter neoliberalization is actually probably more the Porto Alegre moment because it's starting to connect the different alternative visions across places, scales, territories to try to promote an alternative vision. So in a way, in this scenario, you still have a tendentially neoliberalized rule regime in terms of the global financial architecture as it's often referred to. But nonetheless, there's a thickening of alternative networks and it seems to me this is precisely what the World Social Forum is trying to do. Um, it, it, it's based on disarticulated counter neoliberalizations in, in all kinds of different places all over the world and then to create a forum through which to thicken systems of exchange and knowledge sharing and institution building across divergent sites. The third scenario, we still can't come up with a decent name for it. So maybe it's Global Porto Alegre or I don't know, Emmanuel, maybe you can help us with this or maybe someone else can. But for the moment, we call it deepening socialization, which is simply to say that it's sort of an idea of Again, rolling back hyper-commodification, not just locally and in particular contexts, and not just in different policy networks, but really creating a, a different regulatory architecture. Um, some of Samir Amin's recent work, I think, is very creative and, um, and productive in this, in this vein, because he's someone who's thinking not simply about sort of local, or for that matter, national institutional arrangements, but um, the book, I think it's called The World We Wish to See, and it's really, in some ways, a, a vision of an alternative um, architecture of, of the world, which, um, which really would be a different rule regime. It would still be a rule regime, but it would, be, it would have different principles of governance. So in a way, I think, you know, for those of us you know, on, the, on the left, um, we would like to see a radically different rule regime. But one of the implications of this mode of analysis is that um, you know, scenarios one and two are not enough. There's certainly steps in the right direction and local and regional regu regulatory experimentation are fundamental. So we're not trying to, to sort of demean the significance of that. But at the same time, we wanna, um, we wanna really urge for adventurous, creative, radical reflection on the level of what an alternative rule regime um, would be like. Because in the absence of that, um, it's very difficult to think about rolling back um, the neoliberalization, the onslaught of neoliberalization. Um, thank you very much. I want to begin with a, a couple of words about the provenance of this, uh, this paper that Peter Evans and I have, uh, have prepared. Um, Peter and I are both members of an outfit called the um, Select, excuse me, Successful Societies Program, uh, which is a research group of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. Uh, it has a slightly absurd title, but it is nevertheless uh, a wonderfully interdisciplinary group of scholars uh, devoted to figuring out why some social arrangements do a better job than others 
of fostering health, education, and general well-being. Um, when I say this group is interdisciplinary, I mean really interdisciplinary. It, it runs, uh, it, it includes psychologists, sociologists, epidemiologists, political scientists, philosophers, geographers, historians. It's a, a very um, interdisciplinary outfit. Uh, anyway, this group uh, currently is working on um, a, a project on social resilience in the neoliberal era. Uh, and Peter and I decided we would do our part in the project by trying to figure out uh, what to the, figure out to the best of our abilities um, what neoliberalism is, um, hence this paper. Um, what you'll hear uh, this morning is a mirror sketch of the argument that we uh, put together in a 50-page paper, uh, which we have inflicted on our long-suffering commentator, Jim Sparrow. Um, needless to say, this version uh, will lack some of the exquisite uh, subtlety of the original. <laughs> um, Peter and I are going to uh, act here as a tag team. Um, I'll present the first half of the uh, paper and uh, Peter will then finish up. The paper has four parts. We begin by attempting to define neoliberalism, and we do use the term neoliberalism. Um, secondly, we briefly recount the historical course of neoliberalism um, from its origins as a dissident defense of the then more or less discredited liberal economic theories um, through its apogee as a dominant global ideology and international policy regime. Third, we explore what we see as the quite divergent ways that global neoliberalism has been adopted in different countries and regions. Here, um, there's definitely um, um, uh, uneven geographical development with respect to neoliberalism. So I think there are a number of parallels between our approach and, and uh, uh, that of, uh, of, of uh, the previous paper. Um, we then conclude with some speculations on the likely future role of neoliberalism in the 21st century global political economy. So part one is defining neoliberalism. Um, neoliberalism is obviously a contentious term and it's one that's used mainly by people who are critical of current political economic arrangements. Indeed, it's frequently used as a kind of epithet. You're a neoliberal. Um, <laughs> Yet the term does seem appropriate, since what we're tracking here is a revival of, in the later 20th century of certain classical liberal ideals that had been dominant in the 19th century. In other words, a neo or renewed economic liberalism. Um, we see uh, neoliberalism as a multi-layered phenomenon. By the, the, the fact that we, we talk about neoliberalism is an indication that um, we're taking seriously the ideational dimension um, of, this, uh, of this regime that is a, a regulatory regime indeed, but it's a regulatory regime that's based upon a complex, multi-layered set of, of ideas. So we see it as a multi-layered phenomenon. The first level is a body of technical economic theory that stresses the welfare enhancing consequences of markets. Um, this is needless to say a theory particularly well represented here at the University of Chicago known as the Chicago School. The second level is a neoliberal political ideology that favors for example, lowering taxes, disempowering labor unions, increasing international trade, uh, suppressing state regulations of economic activity and cutting public spending. The third level is a concrete neoliberal policy regime. This is something closer to the regulatory regime that, that, uh, uh, that Neil was talking about. That is a set of interrelated policies and regulations ranging from privatization to reduced controls on capital movements to so-called shock therapy to global uh, free trade uh, agreements, the deregulation of financial or labor markets to IMF conditionalities to new regimes of intellectual property. Together, neoliberal economic theory, neoliberal ideology, and the neoliberal policy regimes have had the effect, we think, of producing a more diffuse but also highly pervasive neoliberal social imaginary uh, that values the entrepreneurial, self-reliant, and individualist self. Uh, 
that equates untrammeled pursuit of self-interest and consumer satisfaction with human freedom, that glorifies personal wealth, that sees individual gumption and volunteerism, and volunteerism as the best way to solve social problems, and that associates government programs with inefficiency, corruption, and incompetence. So that's what we think neoliberalism is, that is, an economic theory, a political ideology, a policy regime, and a social imaginary. Meanwhile, we also wish to distance ourselves from certain common usages of neoliberalism. The first of these is the tendency in, uh, in left circles uh, to tar with the brush of neoliberalism all movements or policies that use terms like individualism, freedom, human rights, and democracy. Uh, we would assert, on the contrary, that most modern emancipatory ideologies contain important elements that are derived from the broad uh, uh, heritage of liberal thought, and that such language or ideals uh, should not be assumed to hail from this very specific neoliberal variant of the broader uh, 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 range of liberal thought. Second, we think it's mistaken to attribute uh, all the distinctive socioeconomic trends of contemporary global capitalism to neoliberalism. While processes such as the expansion of world trade, financialization of economic activity, globalized outsourcing, the rise of flexible production regimes, or worldwide currency arbitrage are certainly consonant with neoliberalism as a and ideology, regulatory regime, and so on. Um, we should not presume that these derive from neoliberal ideology or policy. Indeed, such trends may have quite other causes, uh, such as changes in international competitiveness or in the technology of information, communications, and transportation. In fact, the onset of some of these trends actually predates neoliberalism's rise to prominence. Neoliberalism and the major trends of uh, contemporary global capitalism are certainly causally intertwined, um, but I think we should try to sort out the mutual spiral of cause and effect rather than attributing the whole to an amorphously defined neoliberalism. So, so we want to emphasize the more uh, sort of ideational aspect of, uh, of neoliberalism. Part two, uh, neoliberalism's history. In the few minutes that, uh, that remain in my uh, segment of the tag team, um, I can only raise a few key points about the history of uh, neoliberalism. Point one, neoliberalism's origins go back to before World War II, uh, when it uh, was becoming increasingly clear that a majority among economists were coming to favor strong state initiatives as the best means to ensure economic stability and growth. After the war, dissident liberal economists formed their own institutional networks. Uh, these networks were uh, centered above all on the University of Chicago and on the International Mount Pelerin Society. Uh, they used these networks to uh, elaborate uh, a defense of classical liberal verities and in many ways to um, kind of elaborate beyond these, uh, the classical version. Leading neoliberals like Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman also uh, deviated in certain respects uh, from 19th century uh, liberalism. Uh, one crucial deviation that, that uh, uh, Peter and I uh, want to emphasize was their lack of concern about the rise of huge concentrations of power in modern corporations. That is, they saw only government power, not private uh, corporate power, as posing a threat to liber liberty. And I think that, that, that this particular um, um, sort of deletion from uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the liberal... Um, uh, liberal theories is a, is, a, is a major change that has a lot of consequences uh, for what, came, uh, what became of neoliberalism. Um, point two, during the long post-war capitalist boom that stretched from 1948 to 1973, roughly, uh, the neoliberals found themselves pretty much in the outer darkness. This was a period of rapid economic growth fortified by strong state intervention in the economy, and this in all regions of the, of the world. Um, the wealthy capitalist states uh, generally managed their economies by means of various forms of what we can call 
welfare Keynesianism or a Fordist uh, Keynesianism. Uh, in the third world, so-called third world of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, the dominant model was state-led import substituting industrialization. And of course, in the communist uh, countries, the state apparatus encompassed nearly all economic activity. So the state is central in, in all of these, these uh, regions of the, of the world and types of, uh, of regimes. The capitalist world economy and trading system was underwritten by the United States, which emerged from the Second World War with over half of the world's industrial capacity and all of its uh, atomic bombs, and these are about equally important, I think. Um, the post-war capitalist settlement, even in the United States, featured a politics of democratic class compromise that resulted in full employment, rising wages, and rising productivity, along with rising profits uh, for uh, capitalists. Point three. In the early 1970s, the great post-war boom finally fizzled out, and the world's capitalist economies entered into a long and intractable crisis, a, a real general crisis of, uh, of capitalism that's been discussed quite a bit in, in uh, previous presentations. The distinctive feature of this crisis was, uh, was stagflation, that is a combination of persistent inflation um, and persistent unemployment. Um, and the, uh, the then hegemonic Keynesian economics seemed at least to be uh, incapable of solving um, this, uh, this problem of, stag of stagnation. It was this uh, grinding general crisis of capitalism in the 1970s that opened the way for neoliberalism. Point four, uh, the neoliberal political breakthrough occurred uh, in Britain and the United States. Uh, it can be marked by the Federal Reserve's embrace of monetarism in uh, 1979, the famous uh, Volcker shock, um, and the elections of Margaret Thatcher in 1979 and Ronald Reagan in 1980. Um, the American turn to neoliberalism, we think, was particularly decisive since, as the world's hegemonic economic and military power, it had great leverage over other countries. Thatcher and Reagan were both gifted purveyors of the neoliberal political ideology, and both the US and British governments enacted a whole range of neoliberal policies, including tax cuts, deregulation, privatization of government services, uh, crushing of labor unions, promotion of free trade, scaling back of welfare programs. Point five. Uh, over the course of the 1980s and 1990s, most of the rest of the world signed on to the neoliberal policy regime. Although, as uh, Peter Evans will point out, um, with some highly significant variations. The Washington-based International Monetary Fund and World Bank largely imposed neoliberalism on the, the poor and indebted uh, uh, countries of Latin America and Africa. The Soviet system, of course, collapsed in 1989, and most of the successor states have embraced neoliberal policies and ideologies, either by choice or by necessity. Uh, by choice, in many cases, because uh, uh, neoliberalism as a, a variety of liberalism looked awfully good to a place where the state was really much too big and too powerful. <clears throat> The continental West European countries also embraced neoliberal economic reforms, uh, thanks in part to a certain amount of coercive uh, nudging by the European Union. I think uh, this is kind of like uh, uh, Ulysses and the, and the sirens. That is, um, any of these countries, uh, one at a time, would have found it difficult to uh, engage in these reforms. But once they formed the, the, the European Union, they then, in order to be a part of the European Union, they, in fact, um, uh, enact these reforms in various ways. However, these countries, unlike the United States and the UK, maintained, on the whole, their generous welfare regimes and indeed, in some cases, actually expanded them. Uh, in Asia, the so-called tiger economies uh, largely skipped the general crisis of the 1970s. They had been growing rapidly since the late 1960s by means of uh, export-led development. They had, in effect, already embraced the neoliberal commitment to international markets, avant la lettre. Um, on the other hand, 
excuse me. On the other hand, their economic models, which featured strong state-financed industrial policies, were actually in considerable tension with orthodox versions of neoliberalism. It was essentially the tiger model of export-led development uh, that, uh, guided by a strong state that was embraced by China when it entered the international economy in the early 1980s. I've got to get some water. <coughs> Thank you. I'm recovering from a cold and my, um, my voice uh, seizes up at a certain point usually. Happily, I'm not giving the entire paper. <clears throat> Finally, point six. Since the mid-1990s, the neoliberal policy regime has become internationally hegemonic <coughs> and neoliberal economic doctrines have gained uh, ascendance as well. Um, neoliberal political ideology has made important uh, gains, but it's hardly swept the field. Various forms of populism and social democracy, not to mention uh, authoritarianism, remain alive and well. It's our sense that the neoliberal social imaginary has also made great strides in this on a global basis. <coughs> it's important to recognize, however, that neoliberalism actually has entirely failed to deliver the main thing that it promised, that is higher rates of economic growth. Economic growth for the OECD countries and for the world as a whole has actually been lower in the 1980s, 1990s, and 2000s. Um, than it was in the 1970s, let alone in the 50s or the 60s. On the other hand, neoliberal policies have raised profit rates at the expense of the remuneration of labor. So neoliberalism has been good for capitalists, even if it hasn't produced higher economic growth. It's too early to tell how the deep financial crisis that began in 2008 will affect the fortunes of neoliberalism although Peter will, Peter will offer some of our thoughts on that question. Time for the tag. First of all, I'd like to join the uh, chorus of thanking the organizers of what I think has really been an extraordinarily uh, fascinating and productive uh, conference. I, you folks here really did a great job, and I think the center deserves uh, congratulations as well as the individual organizers for promoting this. Um, and secondly, I'd like to thank uh, Bill for being a, uh, a fantastic collaborator. It's been a lot of fun working on this paper with him. Now, as, as Bill has made clear, our paper focuses primarily on neoliberalism as an ideational regime. And Bill has outlined with typical elegance and clarity uh, our characterization of neoliberalism. What I would like to do or try to do without any hope of attaining comparable elegance and clarity is to try to characterize some of the speculations regarding future possibilities uh, that emerge from our approach. And this is this last part of our paper is still very much a work in progress. Uh, Bill and I have traded drafts back and forth. Uh, Jim Sparrow has the uh, benefit of having uh, read Bill's last draft, which was uh, typically coherent and clear, uh, I will inflict upon you my uh, recently formulated revisionist version of the last half. Um, and uh, Bill is in the uh, very enviable position of having complete deniability with regard to uh, this presentation, since he hasn't actually seen it. Uh, and. Uh, Therefore, uh, I am uh, on my own here, uh, although obviously this draft does derive from our previous uh, uh, collaborations. I'd like to start uh, by looking at the 
unevenness, variegation, etc., that uh, uh, Bill talked about and Neil uh, emphasized earlier in his presentation. And here I'd like to make a, a couple of general points. The first general point, which is again, I think, clear in, in, in Bill's uh, uh, presentation of the earlier half, is that during the neoliberal era, the most prominent successes with regard to growth have been in countries which did not conform to neoliberal dictates, but rather which deviated from them in serious ways. And we've talked yesterday about uh, these, these cases uh, quite a bit. It's, we can underline again uh, uh, China as the obvious case in which a, an amalgam of statist developmentalism and engagement with global markets that bears uh, little resemblance to neoliberal theory was in place. As Bill just mentioned, East Asia more generally fits that pattern. Uh, in Brazil, you have a more constrained uh, case, uh, more constrained by, uh, uh, by global neoliberalism. But still, uh, despite what Lula's critics on the left would say, something very different from a, rec uh, a replication of, of neoliberal policy patterns. Now, this is not to say that, that deviation from neoliberalism is per se a guarantee of success. Probably the uh, most successful resistance to neoliberalism would be North Korea, not, I think, a model of success on any dimension that we would like to think of. Big army. But, Big army. Yes, whatever. Um, but in, in any case, uh, uh, we're not arguing that, that you, you can win just by ignoring everything neoliberalism has to say. What we are arguing is that conformity to neoliberalism has been essentially a recipe for failure more than a recipe for success. Now I'd like to go further here and um, at the risk of uh, having the ghost of Rosa Luxemburg come down and smite me, uh, I'd like to suggest uh, that it's worthwhile also considering that social democracy has persisted throughout the neoliberal era in, at, in various national contexts to various degrees. And in at least some cases, social democracy has been a relatively successful strategy even in the neoliberal era. And we can look at various European cases. Obviously, the Nordic countries are the, are the, are, are the best examples here. Uh, interesting to note that Sweden was just ranked by Davos as the second most competitive country in the world. Um, likewise, one could argue that um, not only have European states proved surprisingly resistant to the dismantling of old social democratic structures of social protection, but that in Latin America one could even talk about a rediscovery of social democracy in recent eras. Now, I think that uh, if you buy the idea that the discursive charisma of neoliberalism and its ability to marshal what seems like credible erudite economic theory um, played a role in its rise to hegemony, then that effect, that diverse uh, discursive charisma and, and uh, uh, credible claims to representing some kind of, of uh, erudite economic theory have clearly been undermined. And therefore, if we add that to the fact that non-neoliberal models have outperformed national efforts which used neoliberal ideology as their ideational grounding, then it would seem that if you add that to a sort of growing recognition uh, that that old social democratic Keynesianism uh, that seemed like such a loser in the 70s uh, 
now looks damn good in retrospect in terms of its performance, then it's not quite so uh, uh, it's not quite so unimaginable to take the leap and to suggest that it is possible to see as a future scenario not just a persistence but indeed a re-emergence of a social democratic kind of strategy in the world. Now, I realize this is pretty, pretty. Uh, I'm on slightly thin, thin ice here. Bill is very skeptical of this, uh, uh, this possibility. Uh, and I also realize that it's uh, very easy to come up with uh, quite compelling arguments that in a globalized and particularly in a financialized world political economy uh, that social democracy has become structurally inviable. But I would put the possible resurgence of social democracy in uh, the very useful category of Cardozo and Faletto, which is the category of the barely structurally possible, uh, which is realizable through collective political will. Now, obviously, any, any projection, this projection, like any other projection, um, depends on the big global question mark. The big global question mark being the outcome of domestic political struggles within China. However, if we imagine that in the 212, 2012 leadership transition, uh, which Ho Feng has led us to all be anticipating with great expectations, if we imagine in this, tradition, in, in this transition uh, the new leadership chooses to take seriously the demands of the workers on whom their economic preeminence has depended, reinforcing thereby the admittedly still very weak and fragile social democratic elements in the current Chinese model, then in that vision of this evolution of the Chinese model, the global shift in hegemony away from the US and in the direction of East Asia looks actually quite social democratic friendly. Now unfortunately there are other bleaker scenarios that are probably uh, more plausible than the re-emergence of a social democratic model. And these other, in looking at these other bleaker models, I, I would like to start by underlining another feature of the neoliberal era that I think is as fundamental as regional variation. And that is that if one starts out by focusing on neoliberalism as an ideational regime, one can't help but be continually struck by the limited relationship connecting neoliberal political ideology and neoliberal practice. One aspect of this practice ideology divergence <coughs> is the fact that while neoliberal rhetoric is all about expanding the role of the market, reducing the role of the state, etc., the practice has always consistently contained a massive dose of what Giovanni Origi called a territorialist logic. Nationalism has hardly died. Indeed, it can be seen not only in the contrast between the North's rhetorical commitment to free trade and its fierce defense in practice of neoliberal mercantilist carve-outs with regard to any actual free trade agreement, particularly blatant, obviously, in the case of agriculture. But territorialist logic has reared its most ugly head in the inability of the United States to resist 
engaging in old-fashioned territorial imperialism. Now, the persistence of these nationalist territorial logics, I think especially when combined with David Harvey's characterization of our current capitalist class as characterized by an incoherent individualist short-term approach in at least some key factions. That combination of persistent nationalist territorialist logic and an incoherent short-term strategy on the part of capitalists obviously suggests a system that is not only economically fragile but also susceptible to disruption by internecine conflict based on territorial conflicts. This general nationalist-based fragility must also be considered in the light of the fact that the United States continues to re retain an incredible absolute and comparative advantage with regard to control over uh, weapons of mass destruction. And this brings me to uh, a more domestically oriented source of bleak future scenarios. David Harvey mentioned uh, yesterday the uh, contrast between attempted Keynesian responses to the crisis and those uh, characterized by the politics of austerity. And as he pointed out, the policy consequences of austerity hysteria is not just an ir economically irrational set of policies, but also a set of policies that will intensify the pain felt by ordinary people. Now, absent the articulation of an alternative to austerity on the part of local supposedly progressive political classes, and absent effective resistance from below, then the plausible response to the pain is a xenophobic turning on the other, both the internal other and the external other. And if we put this, these domestic possibilities together with the possibilities for nationalist territorialist conflict that I just mentioned, there's obviously a toxic interaction between the bleak domestic scenario and the bleak international scenario. Indeed, a toxic interaction that leads to the possibilities or the contemplation of bleakness of a sort of Cormac McCarthy level of bleakness. <laughs> and this brings me to my final point, which is the question of what sort of action might follow from this projection of the future. And I would like to suggest uh, that it's worth expanding on Emmanuel Wallerstein's suggestion of yesterday that the immediate strategy of political response should be to, quote, minimize the pain. And I would like to suggest that if you take at all seriously the sort of bleak options that I was just talking about, then systematically fighting against austerity hysteria fighting both in terms of intellectual activity and in terms of whatever meager mobilization capacity we might collectively enjoy, uh, that that sort of fight uh, is, could be a very concrete strategy for the minimizing the pain option that Emmanuel talked about. But I would also like to suggest that fighting against austerity hysteria and minimizing the pain is not simply a tactical, humanitarian, 
feel-good kind of strategy, but is actually a strategic response as well. That is to say, given the possible political reverberations of the pain and their potential reverberations in turn with the various dimensions of fragility at the international level of the neoliberal regime, limiting the extent of the pain is indeed a strategically important response. And here I would like to uh, just invoke uh, a key idea from our friend Carl Polanyi, and that is that sometimes it's not just the change that's important, but the rate of change that's important. And if we're indeed living in a precarious interregnum between a failing US hegemony and a different world order struggling to emerge, then anything that reduces the short-term level of chaos probably increases the long-term chances of sustaining something that we might call civilization. Well, I, I would just like to begin by remarking on what a pleasure it is to have a chance to comment on these two papers. Um, and since I agree with them, I'll leave the floor to the presenters. No. <laughs> um, and not, uh, the, you know, the, um, not the least part of the pleasure is um, that uncharacteristically for this topic, these papers provide some solid empirical and theoretical grounds for optimism in a sense of possibility in what is ordinarily a rather dismal uh, field of inquiry. In particular, they provide an analytical opening, and, um, and it's come up over and over again. I think it's one that will come up in the discussion as well. And that is, by paying attention to the uneven qualities of neoliberal implementation, um, it's possible to break through both in terms of um, empirical examples and analytical um, framing through the sort of totalizing, systematizing um, aspects of neoliberal <laughs> ideology that obscure uh, the historically contingent ways in which it's gained purchase. And making this move um, reveals how this unevenness has been, in fact, a source of uh, strength for neoliberalism, uh, providing opportunities that are difficult, uh, particularly for Keynesian and social democratic system builders to anticipate and comprehend. Um, but also they suggest, and this is I think equally critical, that um, this uneven quality pr precisely provides in a sort of dialectical sense um, an opening for uh, social democratic alternatives and I'm not even certain that social democratic is the um, term that will be used in the future to describe what arises in response to neoliberalism because social democracy has been so uh, closely coupled with nationalism since 1914. But clearly it involves um, some refiguring of democracy on a deep social level. Well, first I'd like to turn to the paper by Brenner, Peck, and Theodore. <coughs> And I think you know, the great strength of this paper is that it emphasizes this unevenness of neoliberalization, but it does so at all scales and not only geographic scales. And I think that's the key to pursuing this line of inquiry is to, <coughs> is to, to take that conceptual move seriously and then begin to apply it um, uh, within uh, scales of abstraction um, and implementation and not just within geographic scales. And this then provides an opportunity to, uh, to find vantage points for um, taking advantage of discrete openings that may seem anecdotal or arbitrary, but actually could become systemic if they were su sufficiently um, disruptive to neoliberal <coughs> policy. 
So it's possible to use this, the, the, an opportunism similar to that which initially entrenched neoliberalism. Another move that I think is really critical here is to disaggregate neoliberalism. Um, and here, I, I'm not sure if the distinction between neoliberalism as um, a, a thing versus a process is um, the critical move. It's clear that at certain historical moments, it's more important to look at neoliberalism as a process. But when it becomes a regime, I then wonder if it doesn't, if there isn't a noun there instead of a verb. Um, <laughs> Which doesn't mean to say that it becomes some totalized thing, but simply that the, the processes um, become um, a thing unto themselves, a system, a, a, a durable structure, um, which I want to get back to in a bit. I think you know, the ultimate question here is your, the position, the relationship that you want to have with structuralism. Um, but at the very least, this disaggregation and the focus on processes um, is extraordinarily productive. Um, so in attempting to flesh out what um, uh, Professor Harvey's moving map of neoliberalization would look like, they focused on regulatory experimentation, policy transfer, and the formation of transnational rule regimes, um, going from disarticulated to orchestrated to systemic. Um, and there's a periodization that goes along with that as well. I think this is helpful for empirical work because it points us to the pressure points, the moments when um, neoliberalism as a dynamic um, set of, of uh, political agendas was able to gain leverage unbeknownst to um, uh, social democratic and Keynesian um, uh, policy actors. And it's helpful also because it's far more precise than this generic notion of diffusion. It, 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 it provides a set of networks and pathways by which um, what we call neoliberalism ex entrenches itself. Uh, it, for example, might explain why American-style Keynesianism um, lent itself to the event eventual emergence of the neoclassical synthesis um, and how microeconomic paradigms eventually gained a foothold that finally uh, overwhelmed the, uh, the original Keynesian framework. Kennedy tax cuts, for example, would be just one example of where one could look for one of those pressure points of moving between these three levels. I, I think also there's some very helpful reminders in this paper. The first, I think the foremost, is the, Pol uh, the Polanyi nod, um, that the market always rests on the shoulders of the state. It's not some um, disaggregated, uh, sorry, um, disembodied market. And as uh, Bill Sewell points out, um, this uh, naturalization of the market um, and naturalization of certain forms of power is, does critical ideological work as well. So by attending to the state um, and taking the state uh, on its own terms, I think we gain real leverage. Uh, and so the paper is really almost entirely about governance, um, which I find striking and is a different mode of analysis than uh, more economically oriented approaches. And along with this goes the sort of the particularity of how governance works, that uh, neoliberal policies had to gain footing in local ecologies. Um, but eventually there is this systemic entrenchment. And so I think what I would ask is that at, um, at the part of the argument where you turn to the notion of a context of context, how is this distinct from a sort of neo-structuralism? It's not clear to me. Uh, it, it sounds like perhaps there's a notion that um, within the interstices of existing structures of sort of fractal-like openness. But eventually you do get a crystallization and it seems like ultimately the explanatory power falls back on structure again. But it could simply be that I'm not getting your project uh, as fully as I should. All right, and now um, the paper by Evans and Sewell. This also makes two very similar moves, but um, at a different pitch of analysis. Evans and Sewell also provide a very helpful disaggregation of liberalism. Their disaggregation, however, focuses on economic theory, political ideology, policy paradigms, and uh, more broadly, a social imaginary, which is part of the ideology. And uh, Evans and Sewell also remind us of how uneven marketization has been in a similar way and point to openings in Latin America and Asia um, that were available, available 
by taking a partial dosage uh, of market medicine, but maybe um, not swallowing all of it. <laughs> Rather than insisting on a pure typology, and I think this is a very helpful move here, they explore how hybrid approaches to the market produced varied results around the world. Um, this is clearly a result of focusing on successful societies, and I think that's a key um, uh, uh, problem to focus on is how to operationalize success in an alternate fashion, health, uh, income inequality, these are key ways. Um, but then to engage uh, neoliberal notions of success and contrast them in a methodologically um, specific uh, uh, fashion. Now the analytic lens that um, Evans and Sewell provide immediately highlights some eye-popping facts if for uh, those who haven't been immersed in the literature on globalization. Um, <clears throat> it's really just, if one's eyes are open to see these facts, it becomes uh, apparent how striking this, um, uh, the consequences are of a sort of moderated or bracketed dosage of, of, of the market can be. In Latin America, uh, of all places, inequality has declined in 12 of 17 countries at a rate of 1.1% a year. And this did not come at the expense of economic growth. Um, and Korea and, and Taiwan both increased social spending 25 to 30 percent after the neoliberal takeoff, if you want to call it that. And this was tied to democratization. Um, this is all in the paper. And there's wonderful detail backing up these uh, facts that would seem uh, counterintuitive uh, to the neoliberal framework. And France spent 29.5 percent of its GDP on social expenditures in 1999. This is after, again, taking the neoliberal medicine. I think this is really an important um, uh, pattern that, that, that's pointed out in this paper. Now the United States and, and the United Kingdom have to take their own medicine. Um, and uh, this may actually produce an opening down the road um, that uh, maybe is not visible now, but um, could, could materialize. There's a sobering chart um, that uh, Bill Sewell referred to in his presentation. Uh, it's in the back of the paper and it contrasts uh, Western European and American GDP. And it's really quite striking um, how feeble American growth is um, in, that, uh, in that chart compared to um, somewhat less marketized European alternatives. Um, now this low growth could be devastating in the long term. Um, and this is a, a point uh, emphasized in the paper that, that the geopolitics of uh, the Washington consensus could be uh, self-immolating, especially, I would add, if national competition matters. And that's a point that I want to get back to, is national versus economic competition. Now, the view of neoliberalism in this paper is bracing. It requires us to at least qualify the declension narrative of ineluctable market discipline. Uh, the market destabilizes, it's opportunistic. Um, and so it can be directed to some degree by those who manage to rule these contingent uh, processes of marketization. So that means that um, electoral leverage matters. Um, it's contingent. And so if the 2000 election taught us nothing, it's how unpredictable, how unsystemic um, electoral politics can be. And I think this is something that is not, cannot be factored into long-term conductive uh, waves. In fact, it seems to be radically disruptive and, and um, difficult to predict. Given the force of the, uh, uh, this also leads one to, uh, to recognize that um, it's necessary to pay uh, more attention to how the market has been harnessed. Um, if the Latin American countries, if the tigers of East Asia, or at least some of the tigers, can break out of neoliberalization's strictures, even if only partially, through a kind of jujitsu that harnesses trade without ceding some collective goods, then perhaps the dynamism of the market can be harnessed without leading inevitably to wholesale creative destruction. Um, of course, the more dismal view, and this is the view that um, is in um, Salsky Assassin's paper, um, 
would be that it's really just laying the grounds for more accumulation and more destruction. Her paper, I'll just very briefly summarize, um, focuses on, um, on uh, primitive accumulation. She argues that we're living in a moment of, uh, of prim primitive accumulation in which people are expulsed, as she puts it, um, from the marketplace. Um, and the idea here is that um, the Keynesian social democratic regime valued people, um, incorporated them into the political economy because it needed their labor. The current moment, the neoliberal moment, doesn't need their labor as much as it needs their land and so, um, or, or other assets that they sit on top of in one way or another. And so they get expulsed, as she puts it. Um, and that this, uh, this like the original uh, Marxian uh, story of primitive accumulation, um, is a necessary breakdown of, a, of, of one modality of, of capitalism making way for, for the next. Um, I think this, um, there are some, I have some issues with whether or not this is primitive accumulation, but the paper shares with the other two papers um, <clears throat> both an emphasis on the centrality <coughs> of unevenness to the process of, of creative destruction and, and sort of neoliberal um, expulsion, and also um, it disaggregates those processes rather than totalizing them. Although again, the primitive accumulation frame, I think, does have a somewhat totalizing effect. Um, and finally, I just want to say that the, um, the paper by um, Sewell and Evans requires us to pay more attention, I think, to the distinction between liberalism and neoliberalism. And I think the biggest conceptual challenge here is um, involves individual rights. Um, so, I mean, first and foremost, as far as I'm concerned, would be human rights, which uh, took off in the 1970s and the 1990s, along with neoliberalism. And I think it might be worthwhile, um, if we can do it in a productive way, to discuss that. Um, because it does seem, uh, on the one hand, that uh, the form of human rights that emerged in those years um, ran counter to neoliberalism in many ways, but it may also have abetted it. And the fact that libertarianism of the new left and of the new right in the same period proved so destructive of the Keynesian center in the United States leads one to think that there were many visions of liberation, of individual liberation, that were on the table, and a hard right neolibertarianism is what became the winner, but didn't have to be the winner. So uh, uh, essentially I, I find these papers uh, compelling and so really what I'd like to do is just raise some questions um, that, that they provide for how to approach the history of neoliberalism. I think um, first and foremost they suggest the need to get beyond the generic notion of crisis and uh, attend to the irregularities, the unexpected outcomes particularly of the period from 1968 to 1982. I mean, as an historian and an Americanist, uh, I have my biases. And, um, but I do think that here, um, a certain form of historicism is necessary given the consequential deep structural transformations that took place in these years. And the point, the point I would make here very quickly is just that um, the play of power in these years in particular um, was highly unpredictable. I think a person sitting in 1958, 59, even maybe 63, 64 in the United States and Europe would have had a very hard time imagining the world 20 years later. Now this is off, often the case in history, but it's especially so given how deeply entrenched power was um, in, in the Soviet bloc as well as in the West. The change is too radical and too dramatic. Um, to be seen, I think, either as inevitable or um, systemically predictable. The play of power is not always systemic at the margins. It's, in fact, it's the system that has to adjust to decisions made by new players. Uh, and here I'm not making an argument against system at all, but simply saying that um, we have to account for ruptures. Um, and I would make a strong plea for national competition, not just economic competition, and political decision, not only political economy, to account for those ruptures. Take the example domestically, in, I'll give American examples since that's my area of work. The Friedmanites were policy entrepreneurs 
waiting for their moment. But as has been pointed out, they waited a very, very long time. The road from Mont Pelerin had to have been disheartening, although cushioned as it was with ample funding. Um, <laughs> and um, if, you, you know, if you read the intellectual history of these figures, they were um, despairing and also saw themselves, I think in some ways, not as utopian uh, per se, but as certainly um, idealist in a, in a fundamental sense. Um, but they were able to seize the moment in the 1970s. And I think if we don't see the 70s as radically contingent, then um, it's hard to explain uh, their experience prior to the 1970s. And internationally, I think third world liberation, likewise, brought resourceful leaders who were looking for a space between the system, between the Soviets and the US, who are not at all working within the system of interstate relations, the um, non-alignment was disruptive precisely for that reason. They brought down the hegemonies generated through bipolar nuclear contention. Um, but let's face it, the Cuban Missile Crisis was not inevitable, nor were Vietnam, nor Afghanistan. Certainly, um, uh, many forms of limited engagement between the two um, were, uh, what one could argue, were inevitable. But the particular form of those and their consequences, I think, I just don't see how you could possibly say they were easily visualized. And I think um, that crisis, superpower crisis, was deeply entwined with the crisis of capital and of, um, and of um, uh, factors that have been discussed today, you know, diminishing um, the profitability, inflation. And of course, this has been observed. All, all I'm urging is um, a more detailed uh, empirical engagement with how those choices produced, um, uh, a, um, uh, produced uh, durable consequences. Now, I mean, I, I think the more generic way to put it would be to ask why would capital bring about the end of the golden age of capital? Um, I don't think declining return on investment is enough to explain the timing. It may be enough to explain a generic crisis, but the things that brought about the crisis and the form that it took um, involved a sequence of political decisions. Um, likewise, I don't think decreased inequality necessarily um, produced that result, um, <clears throat> although again was a, a critical factor. So the competition driving neoliberalism, I want to argue, was not only economic but also national, less rested on a logic of the, of the interstate system. And here I was glad to hear Professor Evans's uh, additions because I really think that this requires greater interrogation, the relationship between national competition and economic competition. And I, if we remember how central war was to the dynamics of the crisis, we see how radically contingent this moment was. Um, Vietnam, the China-Soviet split, detente, the non-alignment movement, um, OPEC's key role in stagflation and the collapse of Bretton Woods, Iran's role in the crisis of hegemony in the 1970s. These were innovations. These were unpredictable moves. Um, another way, I think, to, um, to attend to the role of decision and choices <coughs> made is to um, revisit the failures of Keynesianism um, as a way to explain the timing of events. If we take seriously the question, how did finance capital regain its Gilded Age dominance um, within politics? It's, I, think, I think it suggests um, that, um, uh, that in fact, electoral politics was critical to this deeper structural change. A stagflation was an opening, but it didn't have to usher in neoliberalism. Why was this, uh, the center so vulnerable to the new left and the new right in the West? The new right was in complete disarray. Watergate was just the most visible sign of, of uh, the defeat of the new right. Um, the Keynesian regime in the US, at least, had produced extraordinary growth in the 1960s, which arrested on uh, uh, energized and powerful electoral bases. Um, we tend to focus in, in US history on the way in which that base was divided by the new right, but um, it's, I think it's also important to remember how uh, intense the political engagement was of the 1960s. Um, and this engagement produced 
the um, defeat of the Vietnam War effort, not something that was inevitable or even, frankly, likely. Um, likewise, the Democrats in charge of Congress in the 1970s increased regulation at the same time that neoliberalism was beginning to gain a purchase elsewhere. Environmental regulations, affirmative action, fair employment, uh, human rights, much of the new rights worldview of the 1960s is really actually a view of the 1970s. Um, so the 70s were actually a period of extraordinary regulation in the center of neoliberalism. And I think paying attention to why Keynesianism and social democracy failed is um, an empirical question and one that can be answered within the realm of electoral politics and um, international politics, uh, not only within political economy. Um, and here, I'm simply trying to suggest a methodological fusion. Now finally, I'd like to conclude by um, asking a question about uh, solidarities. If politics is a key arena, I would argue maybe the key arena for contention in this era, then there's an overriding need to identify the principle according to which alternative <laughs> solidarities are mobilized within politics and within society. A laundry list of the dispossessed is not an answer. Marx's dispossessed were revolutionary because of the nature of their dispossession, because it was fundamentally uh, a vul vulnerability for the way capitalism functioned. Today, the primary solidarities, at least the ones that are winning in politics, appear to be populist, reactionary, religious, militaristic. These have the advantage of being concrete, of having a clear lived vision of the commons however revanchist they may be in the hands of politicians. But what, will, what are the foundations, the material, ideological foundations for alternative um, solidarities? Under the hypertrophied abstraction of high capitalism, along with its deep dispersion and its fractal-like qualities, where can these solidarities form that would be strategic to the functioning of an illiberal policy? What would a global social democracy look like? Or just more concretely, what would bring middle class homeowners facing foreclosure together with the poor homeowners who are vilified by Rick Santelli, Rick Santelli and conflated with ACORN? This seems like a political um, puzzle that needs to be solved. What would bring um, <coughs> striking Chinese factory workers together with recently bailed out auto workers? And how would they apply pressure together on problems like monetary policy, trade deficits, um, much less a global safety net. And uh, what public sphere will make the convergent consciousness possible? What would be the material basis for that? Without a sense of these conditions of, po of possibility for these alternate solidarities, um, a critique of high capitalism, I think, is incomplete. And this is a big challenge, admittedly. But fortunately, these papers provide us with some first uh, uh, insights into how to begin to locate these possibilities. Okay, we have only until noon for uh, comments and questions, so rather than give the authors an opportunity res to respond to Jim Sparrow's comments, which I'm sure they will find uh, uh, an opportunity anyway, uh, I want to open uh, the comments and questions to the audience, and perhaps we'll take two or three questions in the hope that there's so much convergent uh, in the topics covered this morning that these questions can be addressed together by the various authors uh, who are here. And I don't know, Jim, if you can uh, find a place up here. That would be great. I'll just uh, stay out of the way up here at the mic. So let's take a few questions um, and see what we can do with them. Anyone? We're at the mic. Oh, you're standing in line. I see. Well, thank you very much. Good. OK. Yeah, I want to um, address the fact that I think that um, the term capital is being used as a total black box. And it's just a stand-in either for a background that is indeterminate or it's hard determinism. Uh, and it seems to me that the notion of capital would be absolutely necessary 
to deal with what Neil called the context of contexts. Um, one of the problems that I found with the metaphor of the Berlin Wall was that, in a sense, it reified and caricatured attempts to get a hold of qualitative changes. Because qualitative changes don't occur, let's say, on August 17, 1972. They occur over a period of time where suddenly, or not so suddenly, one notices that one is in a different configuration than one had been 30 or 40 years earlier. Then one begins to try to understand how did this come about. Now, there is, when you talk about neoliberalization, what you're doing is you're agreeing that there's a kind of a systematicity to that change configuration. And that, as opposed to the neo-Foucauldians, you want a kind of a context of context. The problem that I had was that the context of context seems to be institutional, and I think that if it's in, that it's not in, it's not turtles all the way down. And the reason why it's not turtles all the way down is that you're leaving out the dimension of temporality. And not temporality simply in the sense of, and this is why it shouldn't be structural, an empty space within which events contingently happen, but rather a structuring of time itself. And it seems to me that the only, well, I think the only way to get that is with the notion of capital. That capital is deeply a temporal category. It's a category of temporal mediation. One of the problems that I've had in much of the discussion is the degree to which the spatial expansion of capital is referred to, more and more things being commodified. But this dynamic itself, the temporality itself, is not really paid attention to, and it seems to me that that is the necessary context of context within which differentiation can take place. By the same token, although I agree that, um, and to come to the second paper, while I agree that Sweden is not the United States, is not South Korea, nevertheless, the category of capital also, it seems to me, is a global one. And I think it's been emphasized time and time again that it's not a, it doesn't mean that the globe is uniform. On the contrary, that one perhaps can understand the differences between state-led industrialization in one area of the world and sort of financialization in another in terms of a global system. That these are interdependent and one cannot look at simply the nations as being self-enclosed units, the um, contours of which are electorally decided. Um, so it does seem to me that there is a reason why we organize the conference around the term global crisis, and that, as was said yesterday in many different ways, not all of which I necessarily agreed with, that I don't think you can get at the notion of global, much less global crisis, without a really emphatic and well-worked-through category of capital. So it's a comment. It, it is indeed. Good. So let's, let's, let's see if the next question is able to be articulated with it. Well, I was wanting to question actually the possibility or the growing possibility of territorial warfare. Uh, I'm not exactly sure who you were uh, referring to, but it seems to ignore the uh, uh, very deep level of capital integration and that we really need to look at global cities, global assembly lines, cross-border mergers and acquisitions, foreign direct investments, global stock ownership, and while borders are still very real, they seem to be much less important to capital today. And that also goes, these uh, thickening global networks also go to the uh, idea of the context of context, because they seem to overlay uh, all the specifics of the contexts, which are important to consider, but we also have these, uh, as the last speaker uh, pointed out, these larger global realities of capital. Uh, one more? <laughs> 
Yeah, I wanted to um, address the uh, Brenner Peck Theodore paper um, uh, a little bit methodologically, actually. Um, I, th I think you may, may uh, be able to make less heavy weather of this problem of how do we talk about what we're talking about when we talk about neoliberalization. Um, and uh, I, I usually find the old-fashioned distinctions between the abstract and the concrete um, very helpful in this. Um, and if you put that, if you put the problem in that context, the, the issue uh, is more what's the right level of abstraction at which to address whatever particular uh, problem that you, uh, that you would like to say something about. Um, uh, and I think in, in trying to understand this dynamics of neoliberalization and the dynamics of the unwinding of neoliberalization, um, that would be helpful. In particular, I think there's a little too much form and not enough content on form and not enough on content. But uh, if the liberalization of exchange rates and the liberalization of international investment and the increase in the real interest rate from negative to positive levels had led uh, in the United States to decisively less inequality um, and to uh, uh, a better delivery of public services and so forth, uh, then we probably, uh, people on the left would not have uh, been so upset about neoliberalism. Now the fact was that both people on the left and people on the right understood perfectly well that these formal changes were going to have content and that the content was going to be a redistribution of income and, uh, other, uh, and the other uh, familiar consequences. So I, I think it's very important to understand that relation between form and content politically. And, and just as one final remark on regulation, the folks across the way, um, if you talk to them about regulation, all they hear is, how are you going to make a better decision than the market? Why, why is it that you or anybody, uh, whether they're appointed by the president or by the UN or by whatever political process, are going to make, uh, so, they, so until you can get out of that particular box and understand uh, and explain regulation in terms that don't um, lead to that either or, um, I think we're kind of stuck spinning our wheels. Okay, great. Um, perhaps a, a few comments on these three comments. Uh, from uh, first, um, uh, Brenner, Peck, and uh, Theodore. Do you have... Okay. Looks like I'm uh, appointed to make the comment. Um, one thing I'd say about uh, temporality, which is important in our approach here, um, which also speaks to uh, James Sparrow's interesting question about whether we end up in a neo-structuralist uh, position um, at the end of our analysis, uh, is that our, our view of, um, of how neoliberalism works uh, is that it's not uh, some framework uh, handled, handed down um, in tablets of stone from Mont Pelerin, or in fact uh, from across the quadrangle, uh, but is actually a, a really plastic and dynamic uh, project. Uh, so even though neoliberalism continues to fail in its specific endeavors, it fails forward into other rounds of experimentation. And so in a sense, neoliberalism has been constantly constituted uh, through regulatory failure um, as it's encountered, if you like, a, a, a transforming world. Uh, and so the initial failures of deregulation lead into attempts to reconstruct governance, which lead to further failures uh, and so on. So I think there's a, there's a dynamic which is really operating in the very nature of the, the beast of neoliberalism, which has to be uh, taken a, into account. And, and I think that also speaks to the question of the level, a level of abstraction. Um, one of the difficulties with uh, understanding the nature of neoliberalism is that we can't simply track to the mountaintop uh, uh, for the most abstract definition uh, to guide us in understanding how the, how the thing actually works uh, because of this contingent nature between 
uh, the pristine vision, which is extremely utopian and unrealizable, of arriving at a world of perfect freedoms um, and perfect liberation of markets, given that is a non-attainable destination. Uh, the very frustration of not getting there creates a dynamic for neoliberalization itself. So there's a, just a fundamental and outright contradiction <laughs> between uh, what it says in the bottle, on the bottle of neoliberalization, and what it actually does uh, in reality. Uh, therefore, our argument, and I, and I think the reason why we uh, labor to create these frameworks to figure out what's going on, um, is that it's necessary to track constantly back and forward between flawed realization of an ultimately impossible project um, and the reconstitution of that uh, qua some sort of uh, project. So that's, I guess, how we uh, attempt to deal with uh, some of the temporality and abstraction questions. Okay. I, I just I'd like to respond briefly to the, uh, is, this, is this working? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd just like to respond briefly to the, uh, the question of uh, uh, the possibility of nationalist warfare versus the global integration of capital. Uh, and first of all, let me say I'm not predicting warfare. Uh, if military conflict were to break out in any sort of, uh, say, way that kind of goes beyond surrogates, uh, and, and individual, uh, uh, you know, local uh, arenas, uh, it would definitely be a mistake. On the other hand, when you have a credible candidate to become president of the United States who thinks that she knows something about foreign policy because she can see Russia across the Bering Straits, then you cannot rule out the possibility of mistakes. Um, and uh, le let, me, let me also say that, that uh, um, you know, the idea that, that the global integration of capital will protect us from war uh, was one that uh, was quite in vogue at the beginning of the last century. And, uh, you know, there's this, these great quotes by Norman Angle and, and others saying, well, of course we can't have war because we're so integrated and so on. Uh, I, I do think that, that uh, uh, the global integration of capitalism diminishes the possibilities of internecine warfare. We're not going to have a war between France and Germany anymore, I don't think. Um, on the other hand, I personally have a very low opinion of the capacity of the capitalist class, either globally or nationally, to actually realize its class interest and to behave in ways that are coherent and rational. I am, I am totally with uh, at least my interpretation of David Harvey's vision or one of his visions of, of the capitalist class as, you know, these folks, they're out to make a buck. And they would like to make a buck in the long run, but they really want to make a buck today and tomorrow. And you know, maybe down the road, maybe not, it will happen, but their ability to actually formulate coherent uh, policy that reflects their global interest is, I think, very limited. And I'm happy to hear arguments as to why they are way more class conscious, way better uh, integrated, et cetera, than I think they are. But I have no faith in their ability to protect us from what Polanyi called the cunning animal, the politician, uh, who has a lot of weird ideas about you know, how to realize political and territorial interests. Uh, let's take a couple more questions. Yeah, I wanted to um, get the panelists' comment and kind of take a little bit of an issue of a framework that's come out a number of times around minimizing the pain. And the, the reason for this is because I think, as the discussion has kind of pointed out, the people who benefited from neoliberalism were the capitalist class. Like, and it's true that maybe they didn't have the growth rates that were as robust as they were looking for in one place or another, but profit rates did soar. There are inarguably huge swaths of, well, small swaths of people who benefited you know, <laughs> exorbitantly from this. And you know, that's, a, that's a lived reality. And now, as the crisis hits, what they're trying to do is put it onto the backs of 
you know, the global working class again. And within Europe and the, the so-called developing world, it's to ratchet the screws tighter and try and extract as much out of our backs as possible to be able to go about things again. So the I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that what we've got to figure out, you know, as intellectuals and, and others, what we need to figure out how to do is quote unquote minimize the pain. But I think leaving it there misses a big aspect of it that the problem isn't just neoliberalism. It's not just this method of managing the system. It's a systemic problem, whether it's social democracy in one capacity or another, Keynesianism in the 70s may have had higher living standards and such, but the reality remained that the possibility of driving those living standards back downwards and attacking our side was there all the while as well. So basically, I think that the things that we've got to be able to combine are you know, the minimizing the pain, being involved directly in the things that can fight to stop foreclosures or the, the real expressions of what's going to ruin people's lives at the same time that we're trying to raise the horizons. And I think when you look at this concretely, it starts, it starts to become obvious that you can't but do this. So if you look at Greece and the pigs as an example, if you were in those situations to say, how do you actually chart out a path that can get these economies out of a situation of being attached directly to the whims of Germany and the rest of the European Union at the expense of their own domestic working classes, there's, you have very little wiggle room, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see how, how, how folks respond to that. Hi, uh, both today and yesterday, especially today in the presentation of Professor Evans, there was this um, reference to a possible rising specter of uh, xenophobia, um, especially here in the United States context. And I was just wondering if um, anybody has any data on, in particular in the US, uh, public opinion, how people are viewing um, neoliberalism or neoliberal associated policies, either under that name or under um, you know some other name that because maybe that term wouldn't be used, for instance, in a in an actual question. And let's just take the last question. I have a question about uh, liberalism. Uh, Bill Sewell uh, talked about uh, trying to keep uh, liberal a number of liberal values in the picture, uh, and I, I just wonder how that works. I want to also link that to the question of decommodification. Uh, when you decommodify, okay, you take away the commodity form, but uh, the question remains what, what form uh, of wealth takes that place, and, and what are the values of that? Uh, it, uh, one of the things Hayek says, of course, is that the only just society is one that has no comprehensive uh, collective good. And so I, I think the whole question of the liberalism and the good, and it seems to me like two of the leading, generally regarded as sort of more, more left uh, liberal minded philosophers, thinking of John Rawls and Jürgen Habermas, uh, make a big point about uh, talking about the primacy of the right over the good, uh, the things that you were talking about were more in the direction of the right. Uh, but uh, it seems to me that the commodity form is just the right form uh, for uh, a, a way of thinking that says we shouldn't have any comprehensive good. Actually, it's not because it's really capital and capital accumulation that is the good uh, that goes along with the commodity form. In that sense, uh, liberalism is a kind of illusion. And I think Hayek is you know, completely bogus. But it seems to me uh, we need some really serious thinking about what a liberal, you know, and, and as the basis of, of solidarity, the question raised in the comment, uh, we need some serious thinking at a fundamental level about how uh, certain aspects of liberalism could be combined with uh, goods, a common collective goods that would be specific enough to form the basis to an alternative to the commodity form of wealth that would successfully organize an economy. Uh, Bill, suppose you take that uh, question first, and then our first group and Jim might have comments picking up some of the other things that came up. Right, I can't say that I have any, any uh, grand scheme sort of uh, answer to that question. It, uh, the, I think the point that Peter and I were trying to make um, is simply that um, liberalism um, thinking back all the way to the 18th century, um, has in many ways been uh, been uh, a, a, has been a source of liberation of of, uh, of various kinds, um, 
one of the great problems with uh, um, the, the most systematic attempt to do away with uh, commod uh, commoditization of, uh, of, of goods and of, uh, of life, um, one of the great problems with that, I'm thinking of the, the Soviet, uh, the communist uh, attempt, um, one of the great problems of that was that it completely destroyed what we would think of as, uh, as personal liberties. Um, and um, uh, at, that also turned out not to be all that viable uh, a system. So I, I, I don't really have a, 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 an answer to um, how it is that we maintain um, some kind of, of, uh, of, of freedom, of you know, liberalism in that sense. But I, what I would say is that if we lose sight of that dimension of human life, we're in trouble. All right. So, uh, so yesterday, Emmanuel Wallerstein was talking about the spirit of Davos and the spirit of Porto Alegre as two poles around which we see political organization. And, and I think along the lines of what Peter talked about yeah. today, it struck me that there was a third pole that's emerging. And it's a right-wing populism, which has become coupled with um, a xenophobia and a neo-authoritarianism. And so I'll submit to you three examples of this in answer to the question uh, about uh, xenophobia. And the Southern Poverty Law Center has been tracking hate groups in the United States for many, many years. There's been a dramatic upsurge in hate organizations uh, classified by, by the Poverty Law Center, Southern Poverty Law Center, um, that corresponds with, I think, uh, a rising tide of xenophobia within this country. The second example, I would say, is look at the past European, uh, the elections for the European Parliament. And while this gets a little closer to the polling data I think you were looking for, um, you see even it was low turnout elections, but there has been a rise of a disarticulated, not terribly well organized, but right wing populist impulse in many countries throughout Europe. And then the first example, the final example, I'll just say Fox News and rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, did you have any thoughts about these? Yeah, just just to speak to the question of uh, public opinion, um, I, I think you know, what's striking is, is the inchoate quality of public engagement with neoliberal policy, and that was what I was trying to get at by yeah. focusing on the contingency of yeah. electoral politics, that if you ask questions about taxes these days, you, you get robust support for neo, what we call neoliberal policy. If you ask people about NAFTA, or trade with China or currency, well, currency I don't think people understand fully, but um, you get a very different pattern of responses and it's the ability to um, take advantage of the electorate's disengagement with these technical problems that is I think the essence of the political project um, and it's tied to a deeper project involving um, decoupling uh, democracy from uh, structures of power. You know, you see this in voter suppression, but you also see it in oversight, transparency. Um, these are strategic decisions that are contingent and can be undone quickly, depending on electoral mobilization. Okay. I, I'd just like to piggyback on, on the last two comments with regard to popular attitudes. And I, I think it is important, I mean, the one part of the question was attitudes toward neoliberalism, and we don't have questions about neoliberalism per se, but uh, if you look at, you know, like the World Value Survey, for example, uh, which is not, you know, I'm not defending that particular data, but if you want attitudes, they, they got a lot of them. Um, and, and in any case, if you look at attitudes uh, of people around the world toward, you know, privatization, role of government, et cetera, uh, uh, neoliberalism is clearly on the decline in terms of those of those popular attitudes, yeah. um, and so th th you know it's it's uh, there does seem to be a a, a movement a dynamic there. I, I would also say that uh, if you look at uh, data, even in the United States, on people's attitudes toward inequality. Uh, um, there are two sort of very interesting findings. One is that people, they think there's inequality, but they don't really imagine how much inequality in wealth holding there is. They super underestimate the, ex the extent of inequality. But furthermore, people's attitudes toward 
even the lower extent of inequality that they believe exists are that inequality should be much lower than that. And so, you know, I, I don't think we're, we're living in a world here where, uh, you know, it's, it's the, the, the pesky, ignorant working class that's, that's the problem. I think that uh, uh, there is, it's much more along the lines that, uh, that Nick was just, just suggesting, that, that there are a lot of attitudes out there in the, in the populace that are uh, uh, very antithetical to uh, neoliberal policies and, and, and their effects. But there is a, a, a disconnect between those attitudes and uh, the actual political process, while there's this sort of uh, super amplified connection between other attitudes, like I'd like to pay lower taxes, that are also held. Those attitudes get amplified, other attitudes get, get suppressed. And, and you know, it's a political process. I think Jim is yeah. completely right here. It's a political process problem as much as anything else. And I do believe that this, this austerity stuff, you know, the idea that you can't increase unemployment benefits because it will raise the deficit, but you can, you know, uh, uh, keep the, the taxes on millionaires because that's, you know, going to produce growth. I mean, it's just literally insane, and yet that's what gets amplified in the, in the, in the media. It's, it's you know, crazy. Okay, I think we could take another minute or two if there's another burning question from the floor. 30 seconds and I'll ask my own. <laughs> okay. Um, since I'm director of the Human Rights Program and Jim Sparrow's on my board, I'm going to opportunistically take advantage of his jumping in with this question of rights and ask the panel, um, maybe this is pushing us into another direction altogether, but in looking at the discourse around, very contested discourse around development that takes place within the world of NGOs, World Social Forum, et cetera, one of the things that we've seen is um, that among liberals in a classic sense, so United Nations Development Program, et cetera, there's a great reluctance to use human rights language or rights language when talking about all sorts of poverty alleviation programs, et cetera. And um, it seems that, and so what I'm trying to figure out is whether we can say that human rights exists as a sort of framing of solidarities that can help advance um, an agenda which would be a reversal of these neoliberal policies. Um, for example, and the UNDP, which characterizes itself, United Nations Development Program, as sort of the liberal arm of trying to ameliorate and humanize the impact of some of the policies you're talking about, keeps its frame strictly within Amartya Sen's capabilities theories, which does not see the poor or the workers as rights bearers. In other words, the best of all possible wor worlds, I think, under their framework is that they are the beneficiaries of a sort of benevolent or humanitarian trickle-down. And so my question is, where where, if anywhere, do you see um, a utility um, in the arguments that we would all want to make to putting the question of human rights into the agenda? I, I, I would say a couple of things on that. Uh, the, the first thing I would say is that uh, the sort of rights-based arguments have, in fact, I believe, spread, perhaps not so much in the UN, I'm not sure, but. Uh, have indeed spread such that, you know, you have constitutions these days that talk about a right to health. And uh, uh, there, so there is a, a, a contagion of that rights-based uh, argument to socioeconomic rights in various national contexts that I think is, is, is very important, and it's important in part because I think that rights-based uh, language and the idea that, that, that you have a right to have rights um, is is a very charismatic political uh, uh, agenda and and very a very effective uh, way of mobilizing solidarity etc and it's and it's not for nothing that that uh, uh, you know the ILO and others have have uh, begun to use a rights based argument uh, for uh, for workers issues you know uh, sort of the right to dignified work etc so I I think I you know a lot of people say well that's you know sort of uh, wimpy liberalism to, uh, to focus on rights-based stuff, but I, I, I think it's actually a powerful political uh, tool. Yeah. 
Neil, did you have a? Yeah, could I just add briefly to that? So um, there's an interesting couple of essays by David Harvey on the right to the city, where he kind of addresses this question, not so much through the lens of human rights, but through the question of whether there's sort of a new claim emerging in different cities around the world of a, of a right to the city, which of course comes from Lefebvre. And I think it's, a, it's an important kind of way of addressing the same kind of question. And, um, and what David says, and I think it's, it's really a good kind of response to this kind of thing, is that you know, actually rights can be an incredibly powerful, just like what Peter was saying, incredibly powerful basis for radical mobilization. But the problem is that in the current configuration of the world system, the main right that seems to prevail over all others or to be the fundamental parameter around which any other kinds of rights, human or urban or otherwise, are organized is the right to private capital accumulation. So, um, so the other rights are the basis for claims, but their, their, their condition of possibility is, is really seriously constrained. And I think, you know, so he, he invokes the, the part of capital where Marx says famously, between equal rights, force decides. And I think that's, that has to be a parameter for this kind of a conversation. So the challenge would be to, to sort of put, whether it's human rights or the right to the city, in the foreground and the right to cap private capital accumulation in the background or to abolish it altogether. I mean, again, a point that David makes someplace, um, if you look at the UN Declaration of Human Rights, I think 1945, I'm not that, 48, if you, if you read that document, I mean, I have my students read that when we talk about the right to the city as well. It's, you know, there's a lot of pretty radical stuff in there. Like if you were to actually realize some of the, the, the principles that are laid out in that document, but the problem is that they're, you know, they're subordinated in the contemporary formation of capitalism to, to other types of imperatives. But that doesn't mean they can't become a basis for, again, you know, a, a completely different vision of the world. Thank you so much. I think we'd better wind up here. and. Uh...